Hi, my name is Dr. Sabrina Higgins, and I'm an assistant professor of Aegean and Mediterranean Societies and Cultures at SFU, or Simon Fraser University, and a member of the Peopling the Past team. And this is Peopling the Past. What topic are you talking about today? Well, today I am going to introduce you to my research on female agency or the ability for women to exert power in the ancient world through an examination of how women used art and particularly the art of Saint Thecla to get that power for themselves. Now, I think the question is, is who is Saint Thecla? Well, she was a saint in the first, or a woman who lived in the first century CE who reportedly followed uh, the Apostle Paul. And she is made famous by an account known as the Acts of Paul and Thecla that chronicled her journey with the Apostle Paul. So it tells us about uh, their initial meeting, her uh, itinerant wandering, the fact that she eventually became a teacher, uh, the fact that she was nearly martyred twice, once by fire, once by beasts, uh, and the fact that she went to sleep um, in Seleuca, the place of her resting. Um, so Saint Thecla is a popular saint among women in the ancient world, and my interest in her comes in particular from the Egyptian context in the mid fourth century. And a lot of that stems from this particular quote by Athanasius, the fourth century Bishop of Alexandria uh, on virginity, in which he's engaging with these Alexandrian uh, women, these virgins, um, who are practicing a form of domestic asceticism or sort of rigid self-discipline and abstinence. And he's trying to essentially bring them under his own orthodoxy. But the fact that there is this treatise that's engaging with, uh, with these women actually speaks to their own agency um, and that they are a power within the city that he would like to take control of or uh, to get on his side. So what sources do I look at? Well, for me, it's primarily looking at literary texts. So uh, talking about the wanderings of uh, women, right, uh, their ascetic travel, papyri, which can talk about um, legal status of women and their property ownership, inscriptions, uh, they might donate uh, buildings, if, uh, for instance, but primarily, and what I'm going to talk about today, is the material culture, in particular, the iconography of Saint Thecla and how using her iconography uh, women can exert agency within the patriarchal structures, the male-dominated structures of the early Christian church. So how can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? Well, let's take some case studies as an example to sort of set this up. So I want to take us to just uh, sort of south uh, west of Alexandria down to the Mary Otis district uh, in and around the region of the shrine to Saint Minas. And there was a local competing shrine to Saint Thecla probably in the region and that competition is expressed on some of the material culture that is coming out. And my interest here is looking at the way that these official sort of male dominated contexts like pilgrim shrines depict Saint Thecla versus how women in the ancient world use Saint Thecla uh, in their sort of uh, private uh, individual contexts. So what are we seeing here at this uh, sanctuary? Well, we're getting these pilgrims flasks or ampullae and we're seeing drastic differences in the way that men and women, in particular St. Minas and, and St. Thecla, are being depicted here. St. Minas, uh, who was a, um, a saint known for healing through prayer, well he's depicted as Norant with his hands outstretched in prayer um, and he's got two camels uh, bent at his feet as a sign of reverence. On the opposite side, and there's 16 of these that we have from the site, you've got Saint Thecla, who 
is a bound, condemned, sexualized prisoner in her own martyrdom trial. But we know from the Acts of Paul and Thecla that she actually has a lot of transgressive elements. And one of the things I should have mentioned right at the beginning is that St. Thecla is known for cross-dressing, for donning male clothing, and that element is completely wiped away here. So we're seeing instead her breast exposed, her clothing dripping as if wet, her long hair flowing over her body when it really should have been tied up and hidden away as part of this um, transgressive qualities of her. And we know from the text that she stood up as Norant, right, as in this sort of prayer stance uh, during her martyrdom trial, but that's not what we're seeing here. So there's an attempt to prioritize this male saint over the feminine. And my interest lies in then how are women experiencing her? If we've got these Alexandrian virgins who are devoted to Saint Thecla, well, how did they express their devotion outside of these regulated shrines? Well, for that, we need to go down to the cargo oasis, and in particular to the Al Begawat necropolis. And here we have at least three funerary chapels that bear depictions of Saint Thecla, the most prominent of which comes from uh, the chapel of Exodus. So here in this chapel, you see a painting in which Thecla appears again as part of her martyrdom trial, but this instance fully clothed. And um, she's engulfed by fire, but above her, there are these lines streaming down as if it's rain to sort of satiate the fire. So we've got no male saint here. We've got Saint Thecla as Norans embracing her martyrdom and fully clothed. And underneath her, we have a smaller saint dressed similarly and doing the exact same thing. This likely represents the deceased here. And the deceased in this case, who was buried in this chapel, was very likely an Alexandrian virgin, as alluded to by the presence of the virgin here, these seven virgins, and these two camels being led into the oasis. So a marker of her status as an Alexandrian virgin who was sent into exile in the Karga oasis. We can also look at uh, this particular scene from Athribis, another um, funerary contest, where we've got a similar, albeit rudimentary, depiction of Saint Thecla here, uh, as Noron, again fully clothed, and a smaller individual here um, mimicking her gesture. So you'll notice that Thecla is still engaged in one of her martyrdom trials, but she's reclaiming that. Uh, that agency here, and her devotee depicted just to her right um, is attempting to establish a visual connection between her and the saint. And perhaps the best example that we have um, for a distinct sort of artistic feminine agency comes from the grave stela of a woman named Thecla, um, from the Coptic Museum in Cairo. So here we have a roughly hewn uh, woman, and you can see two beats which were attempted to be etched in on either side. Um, she's also as Norant with uh, her breasts exposed and wearing a short apron. And she's identified as Thecla, um, as a namesake of Thecla. And what the artist has done here again, these would have been commissioned likely by the women, is that they've conflated this Thecla with her patron saint, Saint Thecla. Um, and so the women become one, essentially, in this, uh, in this rendering. So it epitomizes the ways in which a female devotee might exert her agency within her, uh, within her social sphere, right? In this case, her death choosing Thecla as a vehicle for her own empowerment by likening herself to the female saint. So when we compare the iconographic choices um, made by women in funerary contexts versus those from um, on the ampullae in official contexts, we encounter parallel worlds of imagery for Thecla in which the more subversive elements of her story are reintroduced into the visual repertoire. 
She appears as a woman who is actively facing her martyrdom trials with her arms outstretched in prayer, reinforcing and reclaiming the agency with which she was imbued in the acts of Paul and Thecla, and instilling in her devotees that same agency to assert their personal connection to Thecla through the sovereign consciousness of their stylistic choices. And if you want to learn more about this topic, I encourage you to head over to peoplingthepast.com where we'll have lots of additional resources for you.